Well, I think we'll move on to the next presentation, which is going to be by Dr. Joseph William Bull, um, an ecologist, conservation scientist, practitioner who's associate professor at the University of Kent, visiting research at the University of Oxford. Um, the talk is Mud, Oil, Tea, Infrastructure Development and Wildlife Conversation Conservation. Um, and he'll elaborate on one of the themes I think that, that we've already touched on, which is the relationship between uh, industry, between livelihoods and nature. It's going to argue that there is potential to, to both expand infrastructure in the region, whilst at the same time protecting the spectacular wildlife. So please, over to you, Dr. Bull. Thank you very much. And thank you um, for inviting me to join the talk as well. It's great to be here. It was great to hear um, EJ's talk. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Can it, I'm not muted, am I? Okay. Nope. <laughs> it's, it looks like, looks like and, and you can see my screen as well. That, that's all working right. Fine, is it? Okay, great. Yes. Um, good. Um, yes, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's a, a pleasure also to follow EJ, um, who always gives a fantastic talk and has been working in this part of the world. Uh, for much longer than I have, but um, my talk, as you say, is going to be complimentary um, and build on the themes that some of the themes that EJ has talked about. Um, hopefully we can continue the fantastic discussion afterwards as well. I was really enjoying the question and answer session. So yeah, um, here we go, if I can get this to move along. So um, as we've kind of already heard, uh, Professor Milner Gulland or, or EJ has already talked about the kind of the Aral region. Um, so I'm, but I'm gonna kick off by giving, you know, my own experience of it. Um, it's gonna touch upon some of the things that EJ talked about, but this is just, you know, having spent time out in the field um, a few years ago um, in the Aral Sea region and the Ustia Plateau, um, just to give me, you know, my own experience of it. And so why I did a lot was spend a lot of time out um, like this look it looks very isolated this is this is actually isn't my tent it's uh, one of our collaborators tents but uh, nonetheless uh, this is what it felt like for much of the time we we're out in the Ustia plateau stunning landscape I, I absolutely love the landscape um but very you know very specific you know you can look for miles to the horizon in every direction it's a bit like being on the surface of the sea or the surface of the moon in places um and it's you know obviously a harsh but stunning environment and you know we didn't go out by ourselves we went out in groups um and you know different times of year looks very different um and already you know you can the more time you spend there the more you realize that aside from just being a plateau extending in all directions um it's because it's, there's a lot of interesting there's a huge amount of interesting things to see there right um so this is just in the uh just nearby the old Karantarai of Beliuli, you can see the ruins in the background i believe that since i was last there that's um, much of that has now fallen down um, unfortunately, Elena could probably confirm that. But in any case, um, fantastic kind of cultural and archaeological interest in the, in the Ustia Plateau. Um, but also the fact that, you know, places like this, where you've got these kind of stunning um, sites that remain in situ in the plateau that aren't really actually particularly, you know, looked after, I think speaks to the point that we came up in the question and answer session about um you know whether there's more that could be done to preserve the the these sites for for tourists and for just cultural heritage purposes <clears throat> um you kind of get to the end of the plateau and then you kind of see some of the more interesting fantastic geological formations this is a chink down in the south and uh, southern edge of the plateau um, and you step off the plateau and go, go down out, out um in the southern southern edge um which is one of my kind of favorite places on the in the plateau it's as i say absolutely beautiful um and then, you know, one of the things that EJ talks about a lot in her in her talk, obviously, and it's one of the things that I think a lot of people who haven't spent any time in this region, certainly um, people who don't know a huge amount about Uzbekistan, may well have heard of the Aral Sea. And this is what they'll think about, right? They, they'll think about the, the disappearance of the Aral Sea and how it looks from space, which is how the vast majority of people have seen it. They've seen these pictures of the of the shrinking sea. Um, but, you know, when you're actually there, it's, it's a very different matter. And, you know, this is approaching that same that same shore and, and one of our field trips, driving down through these um, these dunes to the to the seafront. And it's actually, you know, it's, it's a stunning place. Nonetheless, you know, despite the fact going back to the previous slide that it's it's one of the world's great, really local environmental um, and ecological disasters. Um, it's nonetheless kind of a nice place to go and visit. And, and even and I, I can tell you for a fact, after almost a year of being locked down in the UK because um, of COVID-19, I would love to be back here um, having a small summer holiday on the shores of the Aral Sea. So 
again, just to kind of emphasize that my, the, I feel like the experience, you know, you hear a lot about places like the, the Istio Plateau and the Aral Sea region, um, but the actual experience of being there is a very different matter entirely. Um, it's also not all, you know, even though it's much of it is desert, it's nonetheless lush in places and really quite stunning. This is kind of another part of the northern Ostia, um in Uzbekistan still, but the northern Ostia plateau in Uzbekistan. And you can see it's actually in places can be quite verdant and really quite, enjoy, really quite pleasant. Um, you also, the more time you spend there, you start to see these kind of subtle signs of what's going on and, and the kind of the history of the land and the, and the landscape. Um, and in fact, the place I'm standing right here, the, the reason I'm, I'm kind of marking this out is because I was there working with some of our um, field collaborators. And that point I'm standing is actually in right in one of the errands that EJ was talking about in her um, in her talk earlier on. So, you know, you start to see these signs. And the reason it does that is because um, there's a depression left over from where they dug those arrows to kind of trap the saiga antelope. Um, and because the, of the, the nature of the landscape, they, they've just stayed there, those, de those depressions in the soil, but they allow water to pool, which means you get different vegetation growing in, in the furrows. Um, so you can actually see these kind of, um, these things in the landscape when you're down at ground level. And that's what it looks like, um, you know, as EJ showed from, from space. Uh, and then, of course, there's the wildlife. And, you know, I'm, there are many people who have taken much better photos of Uzbek wildlife than I have. But I just whenever I, you know, I've, I've <laughs> the, the wildlife there is absolutely fantastic. Um, despite it being a big open desert, there's a huge amount to see. Someone mentioned ecotourism in the question and answer session. And I think the potential for ecotourism there is vast. And that's just based on all the things you can see just, you know, day to day wandering around, um, let alone things like the Saigran Slope, which is obviously what we're, um, one of the things we're here to talk about. I, sh I should emphasize this, this photo of the Saiga wasn't actually taken in Uzbekistan, as I understand, um, because when I, whenever I've seen the saga in Uzbekistan anyway, they've been very small and it's been there behind disappearing into the distance very quickly. <laughs> They're quite hard to see um, in, the Ustia, in the Uzbek Ustia, uh, but wonderful animals nonetheless. And EJ talked all about how, you know, we should make every effort to try and conserve them um, because they need it, really. They, they're one of them, as, as she said, one of the most critically endangered um, mammal species in the world and certainly declining very fast at certain times in their recent history. Um, so industry is what I kind of I was really going to talk about today. Um, and industrial development is expanding across the region, you know, even very recently, as we've been putting together our plans for, for example, the Resurrection Island project that EJ was talking about, and that Elena's working with us on, and in fact, has already developed a, a component of that already and received funding to start work on it. Um, one of the things that we were, you know, we've been looking at recent reports, national strategic priorities for Uzbekistan as a whole. And it's very clear that the Aral Sea region um, is, has a lot of um, national strategic priorities, um, includes not only reversing and you know, recovering from the, the, out, the, the fallout of the, um, the Aral Sea crisis, uh, but also in terms of extract, the extractive sectors. There's a lot of industrial potential in this northwestern uh, part of Uzbekistan. Um, and that's for kind of you know, natural gas, it's for other um, mined commodities. There's a huge amount of, of potential there for, for further industrial development. Um, there's also important transport infrastructure to go in. And it's, it's necessary, right? It's, it's a necessary thing, but it also brings challenges for nature. And often when you think about, you know, having seen the kind of pictures I just showed you, this kind of beautiful, undisturbed in many ways, um, um, arid landscape, um, which is a very unique and characteristic um, um, ecosystem of, of the of Northwest Uzbekistan. Um, when you think of how it might be impact, impacted by industry, uh, you think of this kind of thing. And, and then sadly, that is the case. You know, often, if you have industrial expansion in, in an area like Istia, you're going to get this kind of clearance of habitat. This is um, a site which was a, uh, it is, it's a natural gas exploration site, uh, which has been cleared of habitat as part of the um, exploration activities and then obviously not reseeded. So you end up with something like this, where you get just a complete clearance of habitat. And you can see that's very different to the photos I was showing you before. Um, you know, it's, it's, and it's not the kind of thing we want from a biodiversity conservation point of view. So one of the many challenges with industrial expansion into a region like, um, like uh, the Ustia Plateau is obviously the clearance of habitat and the loss of habitat. And if you don't have the habitat, you don't have the species. Alongside that, you know, these kind of extractive sector activities are going to involve lots of water being pulled out the ground. They're going to involve um, pollution events to some extent, potentially. You know, there's a lot of impacts these things can have on, on, on nature. 
Um, and along with uh, the expansion of industrial activities and the facilities themselves, you know, say, for example, the natural gas facilities, you get the expansion of settlements, you get kind of, um, you get uh, growth of settlements, lots of people moving in, you get waste, you get resource use, you get all these kind of things which expand. And obviously, um, the more of this there is, the less space there is for nature. Um, similarly, I mentioned transport, and I, <laughs> this is just a picture I included because it's um, it was a driving along one of the main roads through the um through that part of the um of Karakal, pakistan and um it's a, a part of the road that they were expanding at the time you can see on the left there there's the, the road service and on the right there is where the road's being expanded um and it was for a few hours just playing kind of chicken with with cars coming to, coming towards us it was who was going to, to to go out onto the the under construction part of the road first the point is though of including this photo is to show that you know the expansion of of capacity for for transport networks in that region right and it's super important it's you know improving transport and access um, to the Ustia Plateau was a big part of not only industrial activities, but also improving opportunities, you know, economic opportunities um, and its livelihood opportunities, etc., for uh, the people who live in the Ustia and, and in Karakal, Pakistan in general. So, you know, transport infrastructure and the growth of roads and rail and that kind of stuff is a, a really important part of industrial development for, for the region still. Um, and, you know, that's that's just the kind of industrial development that we normally think of everything that comes a lot with that is um is you know for example agriculture and and obviously um people have been managing livestock in this year for as long as as anyone could imagine really um but what you notice is that that's one of the big impacts on nature right the, the more livestock we have um and the way they're managed has a huge impact on on habitat and in fact one thing that i found fascinating was as you fly out of karakal pakistan it's really stark to see in these environments but as you fly out, if you look down and you look at the existing infrastructure, so you look at the roads, you look at the towns, you look at the settlements, um, you can actually see at a very defined distance of a few kilometers, of more than a few kilometers, of a number of kilometers away from each of those components of infrastructure, you can see a very sudden sharp shift in the color of the vegetation. And what that is, is that's as far as certain livestock can go in a, in a day and come back in for, for the night, essentially. So everywhere within a certain you know, radius of roads or of, of towns is grazed almost to oblivion by livestock. So, so the impacts of, of livestock and, and agriculture in general can be quite dramatic for, um, for obviously nature and for natural habitats. And, you know, an expansion of industry an expansion of transport infrastructure leads to an expansion of agriculture as well in a lot of cases. Um, and finally then um, there's, you know, people collecting, um, in some cases hunting, wildlife on the plateau and that often is one of the big things one of the big concerns when you have infrastructure and, and industry expanding into an area is that the people there's just a lot more people that come along with that and you often see an increase in in hunting and collecting and in some cases poaching of wildlife um no matter the kind of things you put in place to try and stop that i should emphasize that the person in this photo wasn't trying to poach or hunt or collect that that um, tortoise it's just a, a picture i used to illustrate the point uh, and that no tortoises were harmed in the making of this photo um you'll be pleased to know but anyway the point is the collection of wildlife by people moving into an area is another, is another issue that comes along with industry <clears throat> so so far i've basically just used photos to illustrate my points but this is from a um the last time i have made any effort um i and colleagues made any effort to map industry and industrial activity on the plateau this is quite a while ago now this is you know seven years ago but as part of the forthcoming resurrection island project one of our um, priorities is to map existing infrastructure and forthcoming infrastructure in the region but this is still useful as a way to talk about it this this um this figure from a few years ago because what you can see here on the left is from some of the fieldwork expeditions we did that's um all the lines there are basically where we've taken a gps unit and kept a track you know left um digital breadcrumbs from where we were going um, to um, so we could map them when we got back and show where we'd actually been. And obviously for a lot of that time, we were following pipelines, we were following tracks, we were following roads, we were following rail. So you could actually use, I could actually use that breadcrumb trail um, and a GPS unit to map out where some of the infrastructure was. And you can see there on that map, a lot of the straight lines are essentially pipelines. Um, the, straight, the straight line going from the, the southeast to the northwest of the plateau um, is the main road that runs through the plateau. Um, and is the um, also the railway that runs through the Pato. And the dots are kind of linked to, to, to extractive sector or natural gas locations, right? So you can see where some of the stuff is already. Um, on the right is where a student I was working with, Isabel Jones, who was on the paper that's referenced there, 
um, actually used Google Earth to 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 look from space and work out where some of the major unpaved tracks were in the Istio Plateau. So all those white lines um, were where she was able to find unpaved tracks. So you can combine combine those two images to get a feel for where some of the kind of transport and extractive sector industrial infrastructure are in the Istio Plateau at the time. And obviously that will have expanded a lot since. Um, not only in terms of the transport expanding, like I know, for example, last year we were working on um, preparations for expansions to the main road that runs through the plateau, but also in terms of the expansion of, um, of industrial activities, of extractive activities. So that gives you a feel for how there's a lot going on and increasingly there's going to be a lot of industry going on in the Stuart Plateau. Um, now, so far, really, I've talked a bit about nature and a bit about industry, uh, but what about people? Um, now, EJ's talked a lot about people of the region. Um, and in fact, we have, as it happens, we have um, some people on the call I, I've, I've heard already who live, if not in, in the Ustiat region, who live in Karakal, Pakistan, in Nukus, so kind of, you know, know much, far better than I do. But I'm just going to talk a little bit briefly about people who live in this part that I've been showing photos of, you know, of the... Um, of you know where we we were doing a lot have done a lot of field work and where there's some of those in, industrial activities taking place, and I'm only going to talk briefly about it, but really just to to mention you know, obviously there's lots of lovely people there, um, as there are everywhere in the world. Um, I I interacted more with nature um, than I did with people whilst doing my own field work there, but um, you know it's important to think about the fact that you. So this is a photo from uh, Karakalpakia, which is the far northwestern corner of Uzbekistan actually, but um, also of the plateau, and some of the people we were staying with, um, lovely people. Um, you know, ha happy, very happy in this photo because that because I as one of the gifts I'd given them when we because because it's where we were staying was a um was a London mug which which apparently they were pleased about, but in any case, you know, fantastic people living um in these parts of the world, um, these are colleagues who lived over and who we stayed with a few years ago over in um, Jaslik, right in the middle of the plateau, um. This is a uh, coral by you know a colleague and his sons uh, i hasten to add that the um the tall chap in there isn't a, a, a giant son that's um kirk olsen who's an american who we were doing some mammal work with a few years ago um his wife was equally pleased by the way um to see us there she's as you can see hiding in the window because it was so cold but as you can see from her face she's actually quite pleased that we're that we were there too so you know very welcoming fantastic people huge amount of opportunity i think you know talking about the resurrection island project and the ideas for working with alternative livelihoods um to um to, to for, for people living in the Estuary plateau to work you know on on tourism to deliver services to work as guides to, and provide homestays and all these kind of things i mean it would be people certainly foreign tourists would would have a, an absolute ball to go and stay there um and travel um but obviously you know putting all that aside at the same time there are major issues in the Estuary plateau um with unemployment and that's partly from some of the things that ej talked about you know the the rlc crisis and the resulting impacts that had on local economies um but nonetheless um employment remains extreme i'm uh, sorry unemployment remains extremely high um and as a result you know obviously in some parts of of some of the villages in the plateau you know you have um a fair amount of subsistence agriculture um you know people i guess supplementing incomes or a lack of income by keep by keeping livestock um and you can see just from walking around some of the more remote towns in the in the Ustia plateau um that for example resources are very short you know there's not a lot of money there's not a lot of resources um, so, you know, for all these reasons, the reason I'm showing you all these um, photos is just to kind of say, you know, there's some wonderful people who live there, but there's not a huge amount of work. Um, and if we're so, so, you know, industrial development, in my mind, despite me being a conservationist, industrial development is a good thing. You know, we want more industry there. We want jobs. We want livelihoods. We want um, economies. Um, but at the same time, we need to find a way to do that without completely disrupting the natural heritage of the um, of the region. Oh, that's the final photo, sorry, much more recently of uh, I talked about the expansion of the main road that runs through the plateau. And this is just a photo taken from the um, impact assessment for the for the road, uh, which shows kind of in some places the state of the road. You know, this this is the main road through the plateau and you can see that it's in a state of disrepair in some places. So there's there's a, a, another this is another reason why, you know, there's the need for development because, you know, the people living there aren't going to have employment, income, um, new economic opportunities if you don't have good transport infrastructure to help facilitate that. So um, how do we do this? How do we how do we take this wonderful landscape full of fantastic um, wildlife, um, excellent people, but a, a need for increased industrial development um, 
and do it in a way that won't completely destroy nature. That that's you know the challenge really, isn't it? And that's kind of what myself and EJ and lots of others um, um, just in general are working on as, as a set of research problems, as, as a set of scientific challenges in Uzbekistan and elsewhere in the world. And one of the ways we try and approach this kind of stuff um, is through kind of the some form of what we call mitigation hierarchy. Um, so what I've got here is an image from a different paper. This obviously shows a much broad, a much larger map, right? You can see Uzbekistan is, is nestled in there, but this is um, Asia more generally, particularly Central and Eastern Asia. And um, what this shows is actually, is in a very schematic way, is kind of the development corridors under the Belt and Road Initiative, under China's Belt and Road Initiative. So um, I'm sure many of you will know about this, um, but essentially it's about um, creating development corridors for transport, for new roads and rail um, and shipping and other transport all across the world. And these dotted lines show you where some of these corridors are intended to go, roughly speaking. They're, they're very, it's, it's, it's um, a corridor rather than a specific location for a road. And you can see that some of those dotted lines pass right through Uzbekistan and right through that Ustyot plateau. So we know that part of the priorities in the coming years, coming decades, um, for the Belt and Road Initiative is going to be expansion of transport um, infrastructure through the Ustyot plateau. But what we're showing here really is how we think about trying to merge industry and economic development and nature conservation. And what we what we do is we use we, we say, well, we know there's going to be impacts, right? We know economic development comes with impacts on nature. Um, so what we can do is predict what those impacts are going to be. And then we go through a, a series of steps to say, how are we going to reduce those impacts one at a time? Um, so what we do is we say, right, these are the overall impacts we're going to have on nature, we think. We're going to avoid some of those, first of all, wherever we can. We're going to redesign our projects so we avoid some. We're going to minimise others um, as we go along. And they're kind of what we call preventing impacts. And then our next few options, you can ignore the third one for now, but the final one is offsetting. And that's where we say, well, we know we're going to have some, some kind of impact. We're going to lose some area of habitat. We're going to have some impacts on, you know, there's going to be less habitat available for certain wildlife species, for example. So we're going to compensate for that by restoring other parts of this habitat and their range. So that overall, that we get, we, we end up with the same amount of habitat um, and we end up with sufficient habitat for the for the wildlife species that we really care about, um, who or, or we're really worried about losing, like the saiga antelope. So it's a way of trying to combine um, industrial development, but also make sure we leave space for nature whilst we do it. Um, and again, this map shows a, a very large scale across a whole much of a continent, but you can see how some of those things might happen. You know, we might avoid impacts by creating protected areas, which would say, you know, that we we can't have industrial activities in here. We might look at areas, the brown areas there, where it's low human footprint, um, which what that, you know what that means is it's relatively remote. There's relatively little human activities, so we can use that. We can try and avoid impacting that those areas as much as possible. And where we have to make up for impacts that we do have, we can look for opportunities, for example, for forest restoration. And if you look at the large scale, you know the the green shades in this map are where there's opportunities for forest restoration um, alongside economic development. So there's a lot we can do. Now, this is a very large scale, clearly. Um, one thing I'll just say is that these kind of policies, you know, that, that take this approach where you have some kind of, you know, you're going to have an impact from industry, but you find a way to make up for it through um, nature conservation measures um, is not specific to Central Asia or even um, Asia, but it's widespread. And these, this map shows a recent, you know, evaluation of where these these kind of policies are in place. The dark, the dark purple is where they're really well established and part of law. The, the dark blue is where they're relatively well established. Um, you can see for a lot of the world, we have these kind of approaches in place where you try and encourage economic development whilst also trying to conserve nature. Um, so if we zoom down now back into the out to the Ustia Plateau in Uzbekistan, um, you know, we've been working for a couple of years with different colleagues in 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 Uzbekistan to work out how that applies here and you can look at different parts of the plateau and say well look if you go to the north you've got you've got areas of much more pristine um, steppe or desert habitat it's where a lot of the saiga lives so we need to be very careful of what we do in that part of the plateau so that's critical um, and it's still it's still natural habitat so we can try and avoid impacts as much as possible in that part of the plateau um, there's very heavily modified habitat in the middle of the plateau you can see on this on the satellite image you can see that the slightly light straight line going again diagonally through the plateau and that's where the road and the railway are you can even see from this image where the towns are because that's where the kind of lighter dots are essentially um so that's heavily modified habitat so that's where we can kind of say well if we have an impact from expanding the road for example that's okay we'll offset it by restoring some vegetation elsewhere but it's not our priorities for conservation you know those that those habitats are already heavily modified 
And then you can go down to the far south of the plateau where you have habitat that's critical, but is also quite heavily modified. So you have to be much more careful there about a combination of avoiding certain impacts um, from industry and, and um, allowing others, but then having some kind of vegetation restoration measure in place or, or wildlife protection measure in place for some of those impacts. And, you know, we've done a lot of work, I guess, over the years in terms of finding out parts of the plateau where you could implement different measures. This is a schematic figure from a, from a paper a couple of years ago. Um, but again, it's based on um, quite detailed um, ecological observations in the field uh, put into simulation models to work out where some of the best parts of, of the plateau would be for vegetation restoration, for example, things like replanting um, saxile forests um you know you can see there that's the kind of the dark patches the light patches are where you might focus on on protecting wildlife and obviously that links partly to the saiga range saiga antelope range um so you can apply this kind of thinking at the scale of the plateau as a whole and then you zoom down even further to specific projects and this um is ej mentioned and showed a picture in fact during her talk about the um it was called gas complex uh, the Sergal complex this is a map from that project kind of showing in the in you can see the different colored zones there where that project is exploring uh restoration so restoration of saxile forest on the site as part of these kind of approaches as part of saying well we have the industry but we also need to make space for nature so one of the things we can do is we can restore natural habitat actually on the site itself wherever that's you know appropriate um and finally you know just even last year as i said working on the um the the potential expansion of the, of the main highway that runs through the Istria plateau and the upgrade of that highway to make it more effective as a transport route um you know one of the many things you might look at is how to make sure it doesn't impact upon wildlife and that brings us full circle back to the saiga um this is these are some basic proposals in this figure it's a technical figure from the from the impact assessment of how to design the road in certain places to allow saiga to cross now th there was even talk at the time of you know considering things like uh, green bridges could you actually build a bridge over the over the expanded road that would that was vegetated that would allow saiga to cross or underneath in as underpasses um but then you look at the saiga and you think well actually they're a little bit skittish for that kind of stuff so maybe it's better off just designing the road over a very long stretch of the road to be much flatter and, and but essentially hard to see um, and then have traffic control measures and combine those things to make it a passing point for saiga antelope so they're not going to be you know scared off or, or hit by by traffic so there's lots of things you can do even down at the scale of of projects to try and you know allow this expansion of, of industry at the same time as, as um, protecting wildlife. Um, so you'll be pleased to know now the, uh, the moon is rising on my talk on the Ustia Plateau. That's, the, that's essentially the end of my talk. That was an excuse just to show this photo, which I enjoyed. Um, and I just want to one more, once more time say thank you very much for having me, both of us talk and I look forward to any further discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Bull. Um... If I could start with a question, um, I mean, I I spend quite a lot of time in Uzbekistan working on energy projects, uh, a number of which are, are in this region. Um, I mean, for me, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. To what extent do you think the government does have a sort of integrated, holistic approach towards resource development and environmental protection? Um, we, we, we've been working with last year on, on a wind power project. Which of course is great because wind power is is, is infinitely preferable to, to to hydrocarbons. Um, but wind power projects themselves have ecological consequences. Um, we 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 started the project uh, on a site, and then I think after a number of months, we're told, or well, the Ministry of Energy were told that there was resources under the site that hadn't previously been disclosed, so we had to move the mast which meant that the migratory bird survey was then redundant and we had to do a new one. Um, and of course, uh, we were asked, or that the consortium was asked to do a migratory bird survey overnight. Um, and uh, the, the technical consultants had to explain that they couldn't do it overnight because the birds migrate at a certain time of year, uh, which caused great consternation in the Ministry of Energy about the fact that they'd have to report upstairs that um, the project wouldn't start as as had been planned um, but, but the whole experience made us feel that I guess as in many governments you have you know elements that are looking at environmental protection and elements that are looking at development of, of energy um, I just just wonder what your thoughts are on how quickly Uzbekistan will get to a place which 
has taken other you know countries a long time to get to. I remember when I lived in Norway um, 20 years ago, um, again working in the energy sector, um, there was very little love between the the Ministry of Environmental Protection and the Ministry of Petroleum. Um, so I, I guess this is a you know something that is going to plague um, this area and, and Uzbekistan in general for a while to come. I think that's right. And that's a very important point about the degree to which different government departments are joined up in their thinking about these priorities. Um, and yeah, obviously, it's not just Uzbekistan, it's almost any country in the world, you know, government departments don't talk to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had similar experiences working on projects in the UK to the kind of ones that you described. Um, I think you're right to talk about, you know, how long is it going to take? Um, and I think with the kind of approaches that we're talking about for conservation of nature alongside industry, it takes a while to get to, to get that into policy and law and into practice. And in fact, in the UK, you know, um, these kind of approaches were being floated in policy in 2010, so just over 10 years ago now. And only now are they starting to become really sensible, serious proposals that actually can work, I think. So it takes, you know, a long time to these things to get embedded. And Uzbekistan is earlier on in the journey towards those kind of things than say the UK is and some other countries. Not all countries, obviously, but some countries. One thing I would say is that, um, you know, I don't, don't want to sound too capitalist about it, but money talks, right? And um, and what, one thing that's, that's, that's important to think about is, okay, if you take a region um, like, like the Ustia, um, what's, what's the value of that region? And if, if you've got a, a situation in which um, it's incredibly valued from the point of view of resource extraction, then obviously that ministry is going to have a strong word to say. But if it also becomes incredibly valued from the point of view of tourism, and we know that one of the strategic priorities for Uzbekistan is, is in increasing, expanding tourism um, as part of the economy, um, then it might be that, you know, that, that ministry has has some something to say in the matter as well, right? So I think it's a case of, yeah, it, it's always difficult to get different government departments working together. Like I've found that everywhere I've worked in the world. But I think um, what we can what, what we can do is we can try and um, make sure that that different components of, of, the, of the economy and particularly those that somehow favor the preservation of, of ecological and natural and cultural heritage um, have at least some say in, in what actually happens. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just just to add, I, I think um, the financing of development banks um, and the move towards sort of ESG globally is going to help in that, you know, a lot of these projects are, are internationally financed and uh, uh, financers now have very strict environmental standards, uh, social impact standards. So, so I, I guess that will help even if the government themselves aren't yet up and running. Um, the, the, the people who are financing those projects are going to make sure that um, you comply to perhaps a higher standard than national legislation. So, yeah. That's Does right. Any... That... Sorry, go on. Like, no, please, please. I was, I was just going to say that's right, and that's one of the big drivers of this kind of stuff actually worldwide. Increasingly, is the development banks um, financing them and saying there has to be some environmental safeguards in place if you're going to build, dig this mine or build this hydropower project. You know, it's, it's yeah. an important driver of this kind of stuff. But please go ahead. So, I was going to ask. Uh, now I've abused my position. Um, who else has questions for Dr. Bull, please? Anita, Anita yes. Your hand up. Hi, thanks for a fascinating talk, Joe. I was interested to hear a bit more about your, you, the one of your last slides talking about road crossings and, you know, dismissing the idea of a wildlife bridge, which does seem, you know, you don't, well, maybe you do know where they're going to cross each year, but it's better to have other safety measures in place. But I hadn't heard of, we work quite a bit with species that need green bridges or wildlife bridges, you know, some really tiny ones and some enormous ones. Um, and I was interested to hear more about the this the the sunken road bit and the and the um, traffic you know reduction measures that you were talking about. How how does that work? Mm. Have they been trialed but, elsewhere? Well, it's not not for Cyber as far as I know. So this was something that we spent a lot of time talking about uh, myself and other people, kind of working out the best way forward for this road project. For the saga and when i say that the, you know wildlife bridges were proposed it was an idea that was proposed and we kind of said well you know there's no evidence i mean in kazakhstan people have experimented with thinking about these kind of ideas for saga but there's, there's no as far as i know there's no evidence that it actually works for saga and they are really quite you know reluctant I, I imagine they'd be very reluctant to cross a wildlife bridge um unlike some other species um so the, the idea was basically to make the road as invisible as possible um 
And to do that, you kind of, we, we, you know, we, as I kind of tried to show in the figure, but didn't spend too long talking about it and explaining it, um, was have a, a, a long section of the road, which kind of went down to the level of the, um, of the plateau and had a very, very long, shallow kind of embankment off either side. Um, so that essentially it didn't look like a barrier to it from a side yeah. eye point, it looked more like an open gap uh, with nothing, you know, either side. Um, and then in terms of traffic management, that's when it becomes tricky because what you're relying upon then um, well, you're hoping that then they'll see that's a crossing point, which I think they would in yeah. a lot of cases. But you're then relying also if the traffic increases in density um, or frequency, sorry, in having some kind of traffic management in place, you know, speed control or, um, yeah. you know, sign to watch out for wildlife and that kind of stuff. And whether anyone's actually going to pay any attention to that, um, particularly where it's very hard to police in a remote part of Uzbekistan, um, or sorry, yeah. just a remote part of anywhere, um, then you know that's that's kind of tricky so you have to really rely to some extent on enforcement there yeah. um to and actually... are there different road surfaces you can put down that force people to drive much slower so that they'd have to to kind of protect their car i mean not speed bumps but you know a long surface yeah so we talked about that as a potential engineering solution to that was to be to have yeah. certain as you say not a bump a speed bump as such but something to, to kind of encourage people to slow down um, as they yeah. approach the crossing points and so forth but it's it's untested and it'd be interesting to know i mean i don't know if ej or leno or someone else wants to to comment on this as well um but it's it's a bit of an it's still i think a bit of an unknown about how best to design crossing points for saiga um when you get to in terms of you know roads and rail and these kind of linear transport routes yeah so I think it's very clear that cycles are very bad at slopes. And so okay. if, you dig, if you dig canals, for example, then, then there was quite a lot of mortality in the 70s when lots of canals were dug in Russia and the cycles were migrating. They fell in the canals. They couldn't get back up the slopes. And oh. so I think that's why having a steep slope up to a road, you know, a graded road with a steep slope is really bad because cycles can't get up and over. And that's right. also true for railways and things like that. So... I think that's why the flatter thing is better. And cygers are known to cross roads. You know, they do cross roads. They cross both okay. dirt roads and tarmac roads, um, but but they won't cross them if the slope is steep. And that's the key thing that I think okay. Joe's designing did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Another thing, and one thing I should say just to add to the end of that is, um, you know, something like a wildlife bridge. It, it sounds like the kind of thing you could. Do, but I think you have to be very careful with these kind of ideas because if you if you encourage kind of project proponents to kind of invest a huge amount of money into something like that and then it's not effective you know what you don't want to do is is kind of as soon as you start working with these big developers kind of have them plow a huge amount of money into something which doesn't really work because that's not a very good way to set up like a long-term relationship is it and for them to have confidence that you know what you're doing and that any money they invest into conservation is going to have the result you want it to have so I think you've got to be very careful about what you you know what you encourage project proponents to do. Um, there's another hand up, I'm not sure. Yeah, Mr. Talipov, I think. Um... Uh, colleagues, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, first of all, good evening. And uh, thank you for uh, our speakers, for organizers for this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. So I'm uh, Jahangir Talipov, head of the International Cooperation and Pro Project Department from the State Committee of Ecology, simply saying Goscom Ecology, some of you know. Um, and I've, I've been pleased to watch this in very interesting presentations and a uh, small uh, additional from some comments from my side. Uh, as you have mentioned, the working with petroleum organizations in the, in the region, there is some discussion, there is some cooperation, and uh, maybe not, not in the big scale, but uh, specifically, a uh, local uh, oil company is nowadays uh, uh, trying to support bringing uh, water pumps for the this uh, Saigachi uh, reservoir to bring the water for the, because you know, there is some water uh, scarcity issues. And there is some cooperation. There is some uh, understanding that they they have this infrastructure. They they work with their area, and they feel that they know their responsibility, and they're um, they're supporting this uh, work to bring the water to this area. And another thing which I wanted to share with you that uh, just uh, on eighth of February, the government uh, uh, established a new state um, uh, zakazni, the uh, I think it's called nursery. In the uh, with the area in the um, south west uh, from the Moinak city, 80 kilometers 
So it's a uh, one of the uh, it's large scale uh, protected area. I think it's Asian category four. It goes under the category four. It's near uh, te it, it's um, territory of two hundred eighty thousand uh, um, hectares. It's quite large. And uh, I, uh, in in, in uh, Joy uh, in your presentation you had also this map with the dot for the restoration uh, potential. This uh, map. That's actually in this area, and uh, hopefully the establishing the protected area and the management uh, efforts in this area will also serve for the recreation of the saiga population or other endemic uh, flora and fauna of this region. We closely work on this um, field uh, with our and we mostly welcome. Uh, in our international partners work with us in, in these areas. And I know this University of Kent is preparing proposal and uh, um, to work in Central Asia in these mammals issues. We hope, with fingers crossed, that the project proposal will be approved and it will work uh, under the framework of these projects. And we look forward, we stand by ready to cooperation for um, in, in whether it's SAIGA, whether it's a joint research, whether it's a um, field trips, ex uh, expeditions in these uh, areas uh, to monitor the Saiga and others. So we stand ready and look forward for cooper uh, cooperation. Um, just, just want to express this from a set committee of ecology side. So thank you, colleagues. Th thank you very much, Mr. Talipov. It's great to, that you've joined us and, and thank you very much for your kind words. And, and it's fantastic to hear that you're so ready to to uh, collaborate on these projects, and and similarly, we we can't wait to um to do so. So um yes, if we're able to, yeah. If if I don't know how it works in terms of the British Uzbek Society, but if we're able to, um I don't know, share contacts separately after the talk, and you'd love and you'd like to talk some more, then then I'm sure we'd love to do that as well. So um that'd be great. We'll write my email and contact details for the chatting section. Section. Perfect. Thank you. Always Thank you. in time. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any more questions to, to Dr. Bull? Anyone else? I, I have a second question then actually to, to both speakers. I mean, I guess in the West, particularly in, in the recent past, um, you've seen uh, mobilization of young people. I mean, Greta Thunberg is the, the obvious example, but um, it, it seems to me that um, protection of the environment and the future of the world really is the, the, the core celebre of teenagers, uh, which, is, which is great. Uh, and it's that they're, they're already beginning to have an impact on, on businesses, um, on governments. Uh, we certainly see that, you know, in, in our work as lawyers representing large corporates. Um, ha have you both detected in Uzbekistan that the, that the interest in ecology, the interest in, in conservation, is, is that something that's coming from young people is is there an appetite is there a you know a thirst to 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 work with this um, i think i've since i'm if we're talking teenagers I'm, I'm actually a relatively old person so i'm probably not the best person to speak to this but apparently um i understand that olya esipova is on the call is that right olya and i don't know if she would maybe like to speak to this um hi yes yes sure hi um, hey olya. hi yes so, I'd like to speak <laughs> on you, but would you like to talk about that a bit maybe Um, hi everyone, so uh, my name is Olya, I'm also part of Saga Conservation Alliance, um, and in terms of involvement of uh, young leaders into conservation, we actually have uh, quite amazing uh, educational programs running in Uzbekistan, well, all across the Saga range, really, um, and the idea here is to have the established wildlife clubs, or that's how we call them, um, and it's a network of these clubs uh, through which we can um, stream the information, uh, share educational resources, and sometimes put um, either kids uh, or like larger groups, including their uh, leaders um, for some kind of exchange programs. Like, for example, in the past, we had um, kids camps, uh, and we have one very cool event that we do every year, and this is Saiga Day. That's the biggest event that runs all across saiga rich countries, so in uh, Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, Russia, and Mongolia. Um, and the uh, fantastic thing about that is um, kids uh, and, well, the entire communities involved, and we are talking about quite remote communities most of the time, 
um, they are aware that uh, the problem of uh, saiga conservation and wider uh, wildlife conservation exists, um, and they get uh, sufficient education because, again, uh, in countries like Uzbekistan, um, there is a big lack of information when it comes to wildlife education. There is no such a subject that is taught in schools. Um, you can maybe think that there is bio biology courses, but it's different from conservation and it's important to spread awareness, especially in communities uh, like in countries uh, such as Uzbekistan. So um, there are multiple ways uh, and having this step wildlife clubs, uh, events such as Saiga Day um, and uh, exchanges either within the country or between different countries is something that we are highly interested in, is something that we've been doing for over 10 years now and are very keen on continuing to um, implement those events. Thank you for your comments. Um, I wonder if either of the speakers has, has some closing remarks that they'd like to make after to listening to the questions. Um, oh, we are, I see the Sorry, Yeah, I can stand. see you in the corner now. Rustam, yes. Um, I think you have to unmute yourself, Rustam. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you, Louis. Uh, thank you, Joe, for a really nice presentation. It's really an uh, important issue. So I, I would like to discuss some uh, issues, but maybe uh, after the the presentation um, or event. But uh, my question is about uh, this linear infrastructure. And uh, you discussed with Louis also that, that there is a uh, important issue, international financial institutions, which uh, are investing a lot of uh, money into big infrastructure projects. and. Uh, they have quite high safe, uh, safeguard standards, but uh, do they consider much this uh, wildlife and migratory species into, into this? It's uh, basically this a, uh, big road, A380. A, uh, uh, of course, it's it's event about Saiga, but it's not only Saiga live there and uh, could be endangered by, by this. Uh, linear infrastructure. So do they consider this much? W what do you feel about it? So it's a good question, and it depends a bit on the bank, right? But certainly um, some of the key development banks, I guess, for for Uzbekistan and for Central Asia in general would be things like that, the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, and the Asian Development Bank, so for some of the big players, really, um, amongst others. Um, Really, the, the kind of the gold standard for the for these development banks when they finance big projects um, like these roads is is the IFC's performance standards, um, and what they do they they they're the ones that basically do have rules about wildlife. So they, if there's habitat that's kind of required for wildlife, including critically endangered wildlife, including migratory species, including you know they have a lot of detailed parameters in the actual standard itself. If you if you ever get around to reading it. Um, not that I suggest it, but you know the details are all in there. Um, then they designate that as critical habitat, and there's a, a set of rules that come into place. One of which is that you have to have no net loss or net gain of habitat. So you know, certainly for the for the, for the IFC, the, the as part of the World Bank group, um, they do require consideration of wildlife species, migratory species, endangered species, that kind of stuff. Um, and these safeguards come into play. Now, what's happened, as I say, that's the gold standard, is that a lot of other development banks have copied that standard and said, that's a really good standard. We're going to use that as well. So the Asian Development Bank, for example, who are linked to this, um, the A380 road, um, they also have those, they also speak to those kind of standards where they consider wildlife, um, the impacts on wildlife of linear infrastructure like roads and, and require something to be done about it. You can't just build a road right through the middle of, say, Saiga habitat now, if you've got any financing from the Asian Development Bank and just assume it's gonna be fine. You need to somehow deal with the fact that you're, you're potentially cutting off a migratory route or uh, cutting through a, the middle of a habitat. So yes, in, in, that's a long answer to your question. The short answer is yes, the standards used by these development banks, by a lot of them, uh, do consider explicitly consider wildlife um, and particularly wildlife like Saiga, which are both critically endangered and charismatic and culturally valuable and migratory and all these other things. So yeah, it's it's an important consideration. Thank you. Yeah, of course. 
Thank you. Um, so I have some closing comments, Professor Milner Gulland. Or, or there's another question, yes? Well, I was going to say, are we still doing questions or are we, are we kind of coming to the end of the uh, the time slot? Or I'm not sure what you'd like to do. Um, I guess, oh, it's been answered, yeah. Catherine says <laughs> in the chat. So. Okay. Um, okay, so the question's been answered. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we're, we're coming towards the end. So, Professor Milner Gulland, do, do you have any final comments based on what you've heard the discussion? Well, I'm just incredibly grateful for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all and and for the engagement and the really interesting questions and discussion that we've had and um, so thank you Rosa uh, for giving us this opportunity and thank you to everybody for, for coming along and um, I think we've actually made some really useful contacts here today and um, looking forward to engaging with everybody in the future so if anybody would like to email us to um, to talk more then um, I'll just put my email in the chat, maybe Joe will too, and, you know, very glad to continue the conversation. But thank you. Thank you very much, both. Joe? Uh, yeah, very shortly, very briefly, I guess, uh, hope would be my closing comment. I think we'll, hopefully we can go away from this with, the, with hope, um, because we, we, it's all there, right? I mean, in this part of the world, um, you know, this part of Uzbekistan, sorry, um, the ecology is stunning. The, the cultural heritage is amazing. The people are fantastic. You know, there's so much there. It's just a case of, of what we do about it and, and how we take it forward in a way that works for everyone. And I think we can all have hope, hopefully. Um, so that's what I'd say. Thanks very much as well for hosting us. I really enjoyed the discussion. And yes, my, my contact is also in the chat as well. So hopefully we can go away from this with renewed vigor and, and new contacts. Thanks. Thank, thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Well, as, as everyone's on the call, I, I wonder if you could help us. We we, we discussed a while back having um, an event um, that would be a sort of photo essay of Uzbekistan. Uh, young people using iPhones, um, you know, capturing images of, of their country, the, the environment in which they live. I mean, I know the focus today has been on, on one region, and, and our, our ambition was to have an exhibition, a photo exhibition that would probably cover different regions of the country. But I, I don't know if, if, if any of you here would be interested in working on that with us, given that you are, you know, working with young people in the area of conservation. It's, it's something, as I said, we've we discussed. I think Rosa can correct me, but Shell uh, were talking about such an exhibition at some point, yes? Well, that's certainly what Vesna had, had told us. Um, yeah, she said that. Uh, I'm not sure about the outcome, whether it actually did have place, but there was an attempt to do that. Yeah, and yeah. Vesna would know. But uh, I was thinking, because we have Ola Yesipova here, who is working uh, with youth, maybe she would be the best contact to start with, because uh, Ola probably has all the connections. She knows all the local news who would be um, interested to be involved in an international project, like digital international exhibition. What do you think, Ola? Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. That's a wonderful idea. Um, and also, it's a great idea to exchange contacts. And we have some interesting plans for um, educational activities this year for Uzbekistan. Uh, we are planning about uh, introducing a digital educational system, which is now in development. Um, but I think it can be very interesting and can be implemented wider. Um, it is focused on saiga conservation or, or on the saiga as a species at the moment uh, but i cannot see the reason why other species or other wildlife cannot be included or why it cannot be distributed to um, other regions not just in pakistan fantastic i would like to so have your email I'll leave my contact. email mm -hmm. uh -huh. great thank and, you thank you very much for great well, yeah, thank you very much for everyone for, for joining. Thank you to, to both speakers for wonderful presentations. And um, yeah, we will have another event, hopefully in a month. I, I think the next event will be Sir Suma Chakrabarti, who was the chairman of the EBRD until, until last summer, who is currently, I believe, in Tashkent working with the president. He's, he's now an advisor to the president on, on the reform process. I think he will give us a, a talk in March on, on his... Um, I guess his his thoughts after his his month in in Tashkent. Um, so that will be the next event um, to which you're all very welcome. And yeah, I, ho I hope we can um, stay in contact and, and develop the other theme, uh, a digital exhibition. That'd be great. Well, ha have a good weekend, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.
you too. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.